لا 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 ما تسوى الدنيا تضيق خلقك الحمد لله ما حد بياخذ منك رزقك هدي وارتاح تابر واضمح من حقك بس بلاش العين لا 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 ما تسوى الدنيا تضيق خلقك الحمد لله ما حد بياخذ منك رزقك هدي وارتاح تابر واضمح من حقك بس بلاش in August 1956, where more than 20,000 South African women of all races staged a march at the Union buildings in protest against the proposed amendments to the Urban Areas Act of 1950, commonly known, referred to as the Pass Laws. After a silence of 30 minutes, the women started singing a protest, a protest song that was composed in honor of the occasion. Translated means, now you have touched the woman, you have struck a rock. In later years, the phrase, you strike a woman, you have struck a rock, have come to represent women's courage and strength. Women's Day draws attention to significant issues South African women still face, such as parenting, domestic violence, and sexual harassment in the workplace, amongst others. As men, we should note that being a male is a matter of birth. Being a man is a matter of age. Being a gentleman is a matter of choice. Just as we celebrate the courageous woman of the 1956 March, who ensured that their voices were heard and spoke truth to power, today we celebrate Women's Month. And the right for women to speak freely and the right to be heard. The immense role that women play in all facets of our society cannot be understated. It gives me great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to extend a very warm welcome on behalf of the Congress of Business and Economics. We are grateful that you're all here to celebrate Women's Month with us. Till the time you go to bed, all you're doing is running on this wheel, thinking you're going somewhere. In the meantime, you know you're not going anywhere. That's why there's so much of chaos and pain and stress in our world. And if you can just take a few moments, even if it means you're getting up five minutes early in the morning for you to stop, to breathe, and observe what's happening around you, and then proceed with a new approach and to be the best version of yourself, then you automatically allow others, allow your spouses and your children and your family and your friends and your colleagues, you give them permission to be the best versions of them. Because you can only give to others what you have. And time is the most priceless gift to give to yourself. And when you cry, know that this is a strength, it's not a weakness. When you cry, it is said, how many of you have tasted your tears? All of you, what does it taste like? Salty. Salty. Have any of you smelt your tears? No? So the next time you cry, I want you to smell your tears. It is said that when you cry, it is the closest you will come to your creator. That is why after a good cry, you feel good. How is it possible that inside of your human body, there's no lake or dam 
or a basin of water? And now I would like for you to take both your hands and place it over your chest, over your heart. And again, just for a moment, I want you to say thank you to yourself mentally, without words. Thank yourself for being brave. Thank yourself for allowing yourself to be vulnerable as you participated in these experiences. Thank yourself for being bold and hug yourself. Just hug yourself <coughs> and feel how good it feels when you can love and hug you. We are only mirrors of each other. And when I love and I approve of myself exactly as I am, trying to be an Indian blonde and all, then it's an automatic. The other person will love and approve of me exactly as I am. You are the masterpiece of your own life. You are the Michelangelo of your life. The David you are sculpting is you. And as you start to practice loving yourself from your heart, you automatically send out into the world and out into the universe a, vib a vibration of love. Every person, every plant, every insect, every bird, the mountains, the sky, the seas, the trees and the flowers, the earth, the stones, all need love. Most women are not socialized to be unapologetically ambitious and competitive. Those women who are must contend to deal with men and women who seemingly are incapable of dealing with unapologetically ambitious and competitive women. I am an unapologetically ambitious and competitive woman. As women, we should never be afraid to be smart, strong, and ambitious. It's not my job to be likable. It's my job to be myself. It's my job to be, to be authentic, to be unapologetic for being accomplished and ambitious. I love what I do as a forensic specialist. I'm good at what I do. I'm here and I matter. <laughs> While at times it has been a rewarding journey, more often than not, it has been a difficult journey for me to be me. What I can say with certainty, following what has happened to me recently, and as widely documented in the media, is that I am no longer the same. This is not the narrative, however, that defines me. As I narrate my experiences this afternoon, the starting position, of course, is me. I am Indian by apartheid racial classifications, or as now defined in economic empowerment legislation, I am black. I am also a woman. And while I'm quite happily to be both and would not change these physiological features for anything in the world, these are not the identity groups that are privileged, especially in corporate South Africa. But I do belong to another group that is privileged, and that is class. It means that because I grew up in a middle class household that would eventually give me access to degrees at the world's most renowned universities, I have had access to opportunities that do not extend to people who do not belong to this privilege of class. Privileged? Yes. Easy? By all means, no. 
My middle class journey begins with my dad as a bus driver who without fail would leave 10 rand on the table for my twin sister and myself so that we could at least buy cool drink and a packet of chips at the campus tuck shop. And my mom who sold biscuits, samosas, sweet meats, and AMC pots to meet household expenses. And equally, my own journey, if you're wondering why I brought this. <laughs> and equally, my own journey as a till packer and cashier at ShopRite Checkers every weekend and holidays for four years in the mid 1990s while I was at law school to the last decade that brought me to the boardrooms of Santon Farms. My story begins in the town where I grew up, the very same town where my great grandfather settled more than 126 years ago. It is the town where my parents still reside to this day. It's a place not just where I used to live, it is my home surrounded by my family, by my friends, and many childhood memories. Now, for as long as I could remember, as my parents would tell you, I always wanted to study law. And when I knew that, I had my career planned out in my head. I was going to be a state prosecutor and one day ambitiously retire as a constitutional court judge. Now, not long after my final year results were released, my civil law professor called me to a meeting. Now, in the midst of a discussion of my career plans, he said to me, why don't you study at Cambridge University? You have great p potential. I was actually quite stunned. You see, he had also studied at Cambridge University and he had encouraged me to apply. Now, I remember at the time thinking, but I'm just an Indian girl from rural KZN. Why would Cambridge even consider me? Well, they did. And in July 2001, I graduated with an MPhil degree in criminology. Now, I often think about my professor and how he completely changed my life. He did not have to do what he did, but he did. Civil law was not even my favorite subject. I would eventually spend eight years in England, which also included graduate studies at Oxford. I did have this stint as a state prosecutor when I came back to South Africa. As for the, as for the retirement job, it's probably too early to, to speculate. But today, I am grateful to my professor and the many others since, all of whom have impacted my career and my life in so many good ways. We're fortunate enough that we have a lot of business people that subscribe to our aims and object objectives. We also have a lot of uh, religious organizations and sporting organizations that are part of the Congress of Business and Economics. Um, our aim and objective is obviously to contribute to the growth of South Africa from a, from a business perspective and also to lobby government for appropriate legislation where we believe that uh, there isn't, you know, I, 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 I always, I always, you know, tell the story that I heard Clem Santa said at one of the CBE functions. He says he met and I think it was uh, an American businessman that wanted to invest in South Africa. And Clem had met him and he said that uh, he wants to go into a particular field. I think after about five years, Clem met the same businessman again and asked him, have you invested in South Africa? What field did you invest in? He says, no, he hasn't invested. He says, why? He says, South Africa welcomed me with red tape and Australia welcomed me with red carpet. So we have to lobby government to make sure that the appropriate legislation, I believe there's too much red tape at the moment for entry into business. One of the things that the CBE or the Congress of Business would like to do is to engage government, engage the departments of trade and industry to make sure that we reduce the red tape to bring in investment into the country. I was reminded earlier today that tomorrow is the 26th of August and it's quite an important date for me because 
it's a year since I got a necklace from my boss at work, unsolicited. And when I rejected what the necklace meant, I then had to live a period of time where he made my life incredibly difficult. I eventually resigned from work because of the sexual harassment. Um, what I was not expecting was the further victimization, the secondary harassment that I subsequently faced. I think my message today, especially being the month of August, is that while at times, as I had felt, it was extremely helpless and nobody was listening to your story, I think what I can say to other women out there is have courage, have resilience, and find the support networks when you're going through something like this. I believe that women are the nucleus of society, and we can only give to society what we give to ourselves. And so often I find, including myself, I've got to remind myself that when I give or spend time with me, time, as you know, is the most priceless gift to give anyone. When I can give time to myself, it's so much more easier for me to give time to my partner, my spouse, my children, and charity starts at home. So instead of us being, it's almost like a fashion to be busy today. But what we forget is that it's depleting us on an energetic level. That's why we're so tired all the time, and that's why we're so burnt out all the time. And we spend so much of money with the pharmaceutical companies, running to the doctor, running to the chemist, taking all kinds of meds. That's not helping us. So if women can stop and give time to themselves, it's easier for them then to give time to their partners, their husbands, their parents, their children, because these are the very children that we need to lead for the future. What tips can you give to women out there on how to give themselves some me time? So excellent. The first thing I'd say is most women do get up early. So get up early. Get up. Start with five minutes a day. So if you get up five minutes a day, give yourself that five minutes. While the, you know, while the family's sleeping, you can make yourself a cup of coffee, take a walk in your garden, and just do some deep breathing exercises. Number two, give gratitude to you. Gratitude neutralizes the stress chemicals in the body. So spoil yourself. And spoiling yourself doesn't mean I need to sit in a bath or you know light a few candles. You know, if you're having um, a cup of tea, really, really enjoy the cup of tea. Enjoy and savor each sip. Because so often we're drinking tea and we just gulp it down and not even realizing the flavor or the taste. So it's little things like that. Start with the little things. Farzana, tell us how you got involved with the Congress of Business and Economics. Hi, Pamela. How are you? So the Congress of Business and Economics is an organization that works on small businesses and we basically try and lobby for them to basically get them uh, assistance into the government. My passion basically came on board was when I seen there isn't any organization actually working in this space and myself as a, as a person, I'm very passionate about growing businesses and helping other businesses and that's why I actually got involved. I was asked to sit on the board, so I'm the only woman sitting on the board with a whole lot of businessmen, so it's very exciting, very intimidating to be with such uh, esteemed businessmen, to be sitting on the board with them, but I think it's quite exciting at the same time to actually learn and develop with them. Susanna, you're a phenomenal businesswoman. Thank you. Tell me, what are you involved in at the moment and how are you helping women in society? So my company is Zenopia Women's Business Group. We the regional partner for Commonwealth Business Women across Africa. We've opened up uh, nine chapters of Commonwealth across Africa and we're busy still setting up the other chapters as well. Um, my passion is on women's economic empowerment. We believe that there is a big gap for women to grow into businesses. Women still find it very difficult to understand the financial structure, the funding structure, how do they access funding, how do they actually get into business. Uh, we talk about breaking the glass ceiling, but I think a lot of women don't even know how to actually get to the first step. And that's where we come in play. We actually uh, redeveloping a Zenopia platform. We're busy working on things where we actually can help women, where we got things like the Human ATM project, we've got a Girl Sanitary Pads project, hydroponics, all different projects that we actually work in to help and capacitate women to actually let them uh, identify their own skill set and actually start working within those spaces as well. And how many years have you been involved with Zenopia? Zenopia is a three-year-old company, so we're still in infancy. 
uh, I believe we still got a lot of challenges and a lot of hurdles and a lot of uh, uh, summits to climb up, but we're getting there. Slowly but surely, I believe we are getting there and we believe that uh, our method and our model will actually help incapacitate a lot of women, just not in uh, South Africa but across Africa as well because our focus is Africa-centric. And like, what sort of businesses, women businesses, do you assist with? So we basically assist with any businesses. We basically help you to see where you are in your business and how is it that you want to grow. Uh, whether you want to grow into uh, basically your current business or you want to start a business is where we actually assist you with. And what issues um, do you feel that women need to start addressing for me, from our experience, we think women need to start skilling themselves up a little more, especially in finance and for them to actually understand how does a business environment work because that has been one of the biggest challenges that women actually don't uh, get through. Uh, the other one is how do they access fu uh, funding, how do they actually get through to the funding as well. Zahira, we are putting you on the other side now. <laughs> I see that it's a little different standing on this side of the mic. <laughs> okay, tell me your experience today with the event, with the MC for the day. What inspired you the most? I think listening to the caliber of speakers that we had here, uh, it was absolutely awe-inspiring. Every single one came up with a different message, but when you realize what strong women we have within our community and women who are willing to let their voices be heard, you can be nothing but inspired after this. And what um, do you think uh, stood out the most for you? Which, uh, which of the speakers? I think each one did. I think okay. there was something special about every speaker. There's something that I took about from living in the power of now to a woman who's been through so much in the workplace environment, who spoke for so many other women in the audience who may have also gone through that, but may have not had their stories being told before. I thought it was exceptionally brave for Narisha to come up on stage and to actually speak her story and have her voice heard. The little young lady, Stacey Fru, what a remarkable child. I think definitely going to be a leader within our community in no time. So I think it was absolutely remarkable to be inspired by so many speakers. I think the, what, the, what the Chamber stands for, what the Congress of Business and Economics stands for, is something that is associated with celebrating excellence and innovation and inspiring motivational people. And you saw that every moment of today. Tell me, a uh, woman out there, do you think that um, there's enough that's been done for women out there in society? I, I don't know. I think we have pockets of it. Um, I think we are seeing a lot more women supporting each other on a regular basis. We're seeing women pulling each other through, helping each other get where they need to be. But is there ever going to be enough? I think we've got so much more to do. And when we look at the dynamic women we have in our community, we can be so inspired to say, one day I can get there. I can reach that point. My daughters have op options. My daughters have opportunities that they can go through of which they may not have otherwise seen. So while I do think we are seeing the growth of it and we're seeing uh, systems in place that were never otherwise here, I think we still have much to do and I hope it never stops. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for speaking to us today. Shukran, thank you so much for having me. We are here to enjoy Women's Month because only a woman can take an eventful day and prolong it to a month. <laughs> So no more birthdays, it's birth months for me, right? And Mother's Month, it doesn't matter if you have one picanini or 500, you qualify, <laughs> right? And then obviously Women's Month. And this is why men fear us because we are taking the calendar. Woo! <laughs> right, so you strike a woman, you guys gotta help me. You strike a woman, you strike a? Right, and behind every successful man there is a? And behind every angry woman in this world, there is a man. Thank you.